just wanted to explain why I do these budget forums, and I've been doing them since 2002. Um, every year, hundreds of people, more and more every year, write to us or come and see us and send us letters and emails and visits and ask us for money for important state programs. And every single one of them, I would say 98% of them, I feel like saying yes, of course. And then it ends up not being good news for all of them, especially since 2002. During the 90s, things got better and better, and you're going to hear about that. But when we started saying no more and more, I felt like people deserved to understand why, that it wasn't that the legislature didn't like education or didn't like health care or didn't like the environment. Um, it was that we had a serious budget problem. And so as I learned about why we have it, I started asking Noah, or his, it started with you, it's always been you, <laughs> to come and explain to my constituents the actual situation we were in and why we were there. And then I started asking uh, people from neighbor to neighbor, including Carl's boss, to come and talk to us about what we could do about it. Because I don't think there's any point in learning bad news until you learn what you can do about it. So that's why we do this every year. Uh, this year, again, we are facing a serious budget deficit. Uh, Noah's going to tell us something about that, but today in caucus, the Senate um, mm -hmm. Chair of Ways and Means said to us, it's not an $800 million problem, it's a billion dollar problem. April uh, receipts are down uh, over $100 million over what they were last year. We were doing well in January and February. If it keeps going like it did in April, we are facing another bad, bad uh, year. And there are people in the State House who say to me, um, just wait, we'll grow out of it. We're going to find out about that in a few minutes. Okay, now I'm going to, so we have a serious problem. You also listened last month that, no, yes, last month to the report on uh, transportation infrastructure and how over the next, wait a minute, how many years? 20, we need, we need 21 billion dollars. 21 billion dollars, that's almost as much as we spend every year, just to fix the infrastructure we have in transportation. That is a serious amount of money and we're not going to find it with a hundred million dollar, no, what did I just say? With a billion dollar, I can't even, these numbers are so horrible, I'm going to leave it to, to Noah. Noah Berger is going to be our first speaker, he is the director of the Mass Budget and Policy Center and I knew him when he was uh, well, I wasn't in the, in the Senate yet, but he was counsel um, to the Senate president. So what is it that state and local government pays for, that we pay for with our tax dollars? Obviously, public education. There are about a million school children in Massachusetts who receive an education. We also have community colleges, state colleges, university. It has an enormous effect, obviously, on our quality of life, but also on the future of our economy. Um, police and fire protection, of course, the reason we have reasonably safe neighborhoods and if your house starts to catch on fire, you don't have to go get a bucket to put it out, <coughs> is that together we pay for a fire department that does that. Uh, parks, playgrounds, rinks, swimming pools, sounds kind of trivial, but I'm, I have a seven-year-old daughter, I think a lot of people with kids, a lot of what you do on the weekends and in the summer is to, you know, appreciate these public facilities we have that give our kids recreational opportunities. Um, more seriously, of course, health care and public health. One in six people in Massachusetts depend upon our state Medicaid program for basic health care. And if you get sick, you can go to the doctor. If you need to go to the hospital, you can. And it's not just low-income people. Nursing homes um, are provided by Medicaid for a lot of middle-income people who can never afford the eighty or $90,000 a year that a nursing home would cost. We have that basic safety net because of our government and our taxes. Safe drinking water and clean air, of course, our environmental protection laws are enforced by our government officials who are paid for with our tax dollars. Prisons and the courts, which both protect public safety, don't tell me you can't hear. Um, which both protect public safety um, and also allow our economy to function. Our courts enforce our contract laws and our property laws and allow a first world economy to function. Transportation, both public transportation, our subways and buses, but also the roads that we all drive on are obviously paid for with our tax dollars. This isn't going to go on forever, but um, 
it will make a point, I think. Child care, income supports, job training. A decade ago, we would have called this welfare. Now, most of what we do for low-income families is a small grant, but also job training, child care, so people can get back into the workforce. Human services, this could be 10 slides. Everything from our Department of Mental Health to our Department of Mental <coughs> Retardation, the DSS, which cares for 40,000 kids who are at risk of abuse or neglect in Massachusetts. Oops, um, it's interesting to think, when you think about all of the things that we get, that we achieve through our tax dollars, what share of our resources we spend on state and local taxes. So if our taxes pay for all public education and health care and roads and bridges and safe neighborhoods and ports, how much of our income do we spend for all of that? The answer is about 10%. Our state and local taxes in Massachusetts are about 10% of our total income as a state. That's when you add up together sales taxes, income taxes, property taxes, corporate taxes. And when I think about it, to get all of the things that we do with government and have 90% of our income left over, that's fairly, um, I think it's a, it's a good allocation of resources. And this chart shows that 10%, it's about 10.4% now. But also that for the past three decades, the share of our resources that we spend on government, and all the things I just talked about, has been declining steadily. Um, local, which is the top bar here, dropped dramatically right around top two and a half in 1980. State taxes were more or less steady through the 70s, 80s, and into the 90s. Then in the mid-90s, the state began to become the most aggressive tax state, one of the most aggressive tax cutting states in the country. We cut taxes over 40 times. We cut taxes for individuals, for corporations, for high-income people, for low-income people. And as a result of that, the amount of tax revenue we're taking in each year now went from 7% of our income to 6.5%. Doesn't sound like a lot, but there's $300 billion of in income earned in this state. So that half of the percent is about a billion and a half dollars. Meaning that if we just had the same tax code today that we had back in the 1990s, the state would have about a billion and a half dollars more to spend on public education and local aid and public health and all the things that we've seen cut in the last few years. And what have we seen? Well, education funding is now down about 8.7% since 2002. Um, this year's budget did increase it by about 220 million, but that still leaves us over 350 million below where we were when you adjust for inflation using the right inflation factor. Higher education, the cuts are even worse. We're down by about 18% below where we were just eight years ago. And if you think about Massachusetts and what our economy depends on, we're not a state that has a lot of natural resources. We don't have oil or coal or anything like that. We have you know, well-educated, well-trained people who can attract employers who are looking for that. And if we stop investing in public higher education, we risk losing that, and an 18% cut is fairly severe. Public health is down by about 15%. Since eight years ago, a big example is our anti-smoking program. We had one of the most effective anti-smoking programs in the country being funded at about $50 million a year. And when it was, smoking rates for kids were dropping throughout the 1990s. That program was all but eliminated a few years ago, and now we've seen the smoking levels level off. And in the long term, again, that's going to have a real effect on the ability for you know, kids not to get cancer when they grow up. Environmental affairs is down by about 24%. The quote there was from an internal Department of Environmental Protection memo that the Globe got a couple of years ago that warned that there's significantly increasing risks to public health and the environment as a result of the budget cuts. And if you think about it, you know, a rich state like Massachusetts and a rich country, they were not spending enough on basic environmental protection to keep our air and water safe. That's um, scary. And you're all probably familiar with this. Local aid is down by about 11% over the past eight years to pay for the tax cuts at the state level of the 1990s, and that both can reduce the quality of local services, fewer police on other basic local services not being adequately funded, and it just shifts costs onto the property tax. There's some basic level of services that people need, and if we cut the income tax and cut local aid, eventually that cost is just going to be shifted onto the property tax, which is what's happened. How did we get here? Um, this chart, to, to understand where the fiscal crisis came from, you need to look back over the last 10 or 15 years to see what the policy choices were that led to this. The blue line back there is what would have happened to state revenue each year if they had grown at about 3% a year. 
When we say 3%, because over the long term, the economy grows at 3% a year. So if your tax system is stable and efficient, revenue is growing about 3% in real terms a year, which is a good thing because of the long term costs do as well. So costs like healthcare grow significantly faster. The yellow area in front is what actually happened to state revenue over that period. And as you can see, it rose in about 3% a year and then dropped dramatically in 2001 and it's climbed up a little bit more since then. Looking at that, it actually looks like the familiar but wrong picture, which we'll fix in a second, that the fiscal crisis was caused by the national recession there in 2001. <coughs> the reason that's an incomplete picture is that the actual tax revenue in front is the result of two different factors, changes in the economy and changes in tax policy. And to see what's actually happening, you have to separate those two things out and say how much revenue would we have had each year if there had been no changes in tax policy. The red line in the back shows that. And as you can see, a couple of things. One is, at the bottom of the recession, the average rate of growth was right about what history would have predicted. It was still about 3% over that period. But there's an enormous boom and then a bust. And the fiscal crisis was really caused by what the state did during that boom period. We had a period here of a temporary increase in revenue. Revenue was growing 10 or 11% a year with the dot-com boom. We should have known that that couldn't go on forever. And if we knew that, what we could have done there is spent that money on one-time things. You could have you know, put more money into the rainy day fund or build schools and paid for them or paid down on funded pension liabilities. Um, you even could have done one-time tax cuts. And if you had done any of those things, then when the recession came, as it surely would eventually, you would just stop doing them. And our revenues would have been up there, which would have been $3 billion above where they were. We wouldn't have had the fiscal crisis. Instead, during this period, the state enacted permanent tax cuts. You had a temporary revenue surplus, and you enacted permanent tax cuts. So revenue, instead of coming in up here, was way down here. It looked okay for a while because we had that bubble, but when the economy came back to Earth, we realized that the $3 billion in tax cuts had created a structural deficit of about $3 billion. The states now closed much of that, partly by raising taxes, by about 30 the amount we cut them, and partly by cutting all the programs we talked about a moment ago. Um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about the governor's proposal in, with his budget to change the way to um, change our tax laws to try to make tax avoidance by big companies more difficult. But before I do that, it's worth sort of looking at the issue of tax policy and economic development. Because you often hear, if you make tax avoidance harder, companies are going to leave and they're not going to want to do business here. Um, I don't think it's a very convincing argument. We can look at the state in the 90s tried to actually use our tax code to attract businesses on the theory that you know, big tax cuts could bring businesses here. For the most part, it didn't work. This is one example. One of our largest tax, well, a, a significant tax cut was what was called the single sales factor for manufacturers. And essentially what happened was we were losing manufacturing jobs in the early 90s. The manufacturing leaders came to the state legislature and said, if you give us a big tax cut, we think we can bring back the manufacturing economy in Massachusetts. And the legislature did enact a very significant tax cut for manufacturers. And it was phased in over several years. While it was being phased in, it had, uh, we saw no manufacturing jobs come back to the state. It may be that it had to be fully phased in to be fully effective. So we can then look at what happened to manufacturing jobs after it was fully phased in. <laughs> um, now, of course, we didn't lose these jobs because of the tax cut. We lost manufacturing jobs for reasons that are much more national and international than anything we can do with our state tax code. The point is, fairly significant tax cut was not enough to fight against much broader um, currents. And where Massachusetts does have a strength, a competitive advantage going forward, is in the education and skills of our people. And more and more, I remember when this tax code was enacted, there was this hope that you can bring back the forty or $50,000 a year jobs for people with just a high school degree. Um, the truth is, that's not going to happen, um, unless you have to really change the unionization of America. Um, but there are jobs out there that pay fifty or sixty thousand dollars. But you need a higher level of education to get them. And if we take the money that we are using on these tax breaks and instead spend that in our community colleges and our state colleges and our elementary and secondary schools, we can build the kind of workforce that will attract high wage employers. Okay, so the governor has proposed a few things to reduce corporate tax avoidance. To begin this, it's worth taking a half a step back and talking about how we tax corporations, because I think it's the thing that most of us don't know. Um, picture a company, simple company with four people, 
two people who live in Maine and work in the office there for this company writing software, one person who sells that software in Massachusetts, and one person who sells that software in New Hampshire. And let's say over the course of the year they make a million dollars. Um, where did they make the million dollars? Did they make it in Maine or New Hampshire or Massachusetts? Um, nobody knows. It's actually an unknowable question. There's no inherent way to say where they made the money. They made it in all three states because they're doing business in all three states. And about 100 years ago, every state recognized that and decided that the way we would tax multi-state companies is we would just apportion their income based on objective factors. So the states basically look at where your property is, where your payroll is, where your employees are, and where your sales are. And we say we'll attribute that share of your profits to the state that is consistent with the share of your payroll, property, and sales. So for example, this state had uh, half of its employees in Maine, all of its property in this example, and none of its sales. So we say, since you do the math, that comes out to half, half of its profits are going to be attributed to Maine, a quarter to Massachusetts, a quarter to New Hampshire. Um, it's sort of a rough way of doing it, but it's objective factors, it's easy to apply, it's what every state does, it basically works. The problem is, if that company then divides itself into three subsidiaries, then it says, we're not one company, we're three companies. And the system Massachusetts now uses, we, which is called separate entity reporting, we would now just look at the profits of the Massachusetts subsidiary. The problem with that is, the company very much gets to structure what the profits of the Massachusetts subsidiary are. So let's say, for example, that Maine doesn't have a corporate income tax, and Massachusetts and New Hampshire do, for the purposes of this example. The company is now going to try to make sure that it shows up with all of its profits in the Maine subsidiary and not in Massachusetts. How does it do that? There are a couple of ways. One is what's called transfer pricing. Let's say that their software retails for $100. They can then just have the Maine people who make the software transfer it to the Massachusetts subsidiary for $100. $100 in profit in Maine. Massachusetts then resells it for $100, makes no profit um, because it's paying the same price that it's selling it for, and they, when, they would then show up with no income in Massachusetts, all of their income in Maine. Maine doesn't tax corporate income in this example, so they wouldn't pay any tax. Now, is it that easy? Not quite, but almost. The state can go after them and try to fight with the company about every one of these transfer prices and try to make the case that they're cheating on the transfer pricing. That's very, very difficult. And the number of transfers that occur, um, you can see that it's not that hard to reduce your taxes. But it actually gets even worse. Let's assume as in fact it is, Maine has a corporate income tax as do Massachusetts and New Hampshire. What does the company do then? They send the subsidiary in the state that doesn't have a corporate income tax, like Nevada. And then after the people in Maine write the software, they transfer the rights to the software to the Nevada subsidiary. Then when you sell the software in Massachusetts, the salesman tells the purchaser to send the check to the Nevada subsidiary that owns the rights to the software. Same thing for New Hampshire. And then all the profits show up in Nevada. You make no profits in Maine where you write the software and no profits in Massachusetts or New Hampshire where you sell the software. Um, so the problem here, obviously, is that when you try to tax different subsidiaries differently, then the company that's setting up the subsidiary controls largely where their taxable income is. Um, what's the solution? It's actually very simple. It's called combined reporting. You just say...